Good evening and welcome. I'm Bob Ellis, the executive director here at the Natural History Institute, and I am happy to present the premier screening in Prescott, Arizona of Parched, the art of water in the Southwest. <laughs> if you haven't experienced the exhibition in the gallery, I invite you all who are here and those who are watching online tonight to come to the exhibition. It's open, free to the public, Tuesday through Friday, 11 to 4. And then from 5 to 7.30 on all fourth Friday walks between now and April the 8th when the exhibition closes. I want to draw your attention to two upcoming parched related events here at the Natural History Institute. On March the 26th, parched artist Neil Galloway and the Natural History Institute program director, Jesse Rack, will conduct a workshop titled Artwork Ideas and How to Create Them. And that will be a, a field workshop. Tickets are available on Eventbrite. I also want to bring your attention to a special one-time only public performance by Prescott's own Delisa Miles called Sorry in Memory. You'll see excerpts of a similar performance from the documentary tonight. Admission is free, however, you need to reserve your seat on Eventbrite and there is limited seating. Finally, I encourage you to visit our website to see all of the exciting upcoming events sponsored by the Natural History Institute, which includes numerous speakers, a San Juan River trip, a desert wildflower walk, and more. Just to remind you, we are a nonprofit, and we're in our final year of the IRS public support test. So if you appreciate events like this, uh, like the Parched Exhibition and the events that we have on our schedule, I invite you to support our mission. And for those of you who have done so, thank you very much. Now, I would like to introduce you to the curator of Parched, the art of water in the Southwest, Julie Comnick. Hi, it's great to see so many familiar faces here. There's probably others underneath the mask, so if I don't remember you, make sure to let me know who you are. Um, it's really an honor to be here at the Natural History Institute and have the Parched Exhibition hosted in this space. That's very meaningful to myself and many of the artists involved, so thank you for that. Um, I'm also joined here tonight with um, co-producer for the Parched documentary, um, Dr. Jane Marks, who's professor of biology at Northern Arizona University. Jane was instrumental on the um, steering committee for the Parched exhibition over the course of two and a half years. And when it came time to recognize that we were mounting this um, large exhibition right at the height of COVID in 2020, 2020 um, having the the, just the forethought to produce a documentary work that could um, go beyond the scope of the exhibition and rec recognize that we could actually reach a much wider audience than those people who would ever have been able to visit it in person. So I um, wanted to introduce Jane um, in that capacity, and we're looking forward to a discussion afterwards, but I'll let you yep. take it from here. Thank you very much. Um, this was a super fun project for me. Um, my role was on the steering committee was to coordinate a lot of the field trips that we went to and to coordinate some of the science and the policy education behind the artists. Um, and so when we had the opportunity to pivot to the documentary, um, it provides a really cool inside view, particularly people like me that are scientists of you know how artists think and how artists make art. And so I feel that um, it ended up being a blessing in disguise because we got to create a product that we probably wouldn't have created that I think tells the story, um, it, it enhances the story of the exhibit. Oh, and I also wanna thank the National Science Foundation because I essentially called our program officer and said, help, um, will you send me some money? And they did. <laughs> Great, and so with that, we'll go ahead and start the video. This is the first time we get to see it on a screen this large, so that'll be fun. Um, and then um, 
keep in mind of any notes or questions you have, and we're looking forward to a discussion afterward. Oh yeah, we rapid COVID test negative. Parched, the Art of Water in the Southwest is an exhibition that looks at the complex relationship we have with water in the face of climate change. So essentially, nine Arizona-based artists came together and created an exhibition, a body of artworks that reflects diverse perspectives informed by scientific inquiry that reflects the deep complexity and challenges we face with water. This exhibition comes out of the past arts and science collaborations by the Flagstaff Arts Council. So by bringing together the arts and sciences, the idea is that a group of artists spends a week learning from water experts, policy makers, conservationists, scientists on the topic, in this case, water. I was invited into this project by the Arts Council as a scientific expert and leader. And I was tasked with the stakeholder group to, or the steering committee, to design a boot camp. So I had one week to figure out how to teach a group of artists um, as much as I possibly could about water in the Southwest. We decided to find sites that were visually compelling that brought up the conflicts and trade-offs around water issues. And so rather than have an in-class curriculum, we decided to base it more on field trips. So we went on these field trips um, all over northern Arizona and down into the valley, sort of tracing the path of water. We, the boot camp was in January 2019. There was a lot of snowfall, so thinking about the snow starting in the peaks and running downhill. We started up high in northern Arizona. We went to the reservation. We went to see the Glen Canyon Dam, we talked about hydropower, we came down to see Fossil Creek, we saw disturbed habitats, we saw restored habitats, we went to a wastewater treatment plant, we visited the Central Arizona Project. So we went to you know, a week's worth of sites, all of which depicted many of the trade-offs and conflicts around water issues in the Southwest. Um, I think a lot of the artists really responded to those conflicts and the contrasts and the disparities that was, I think, presented by seeing those, those elements back to back. You know, in the space of five days over a large geographical footprint, we were really able to see the path that water takes um, and how many inequities are part of that. Parch conveys an urgency that I feel is really at the core of this project. It's, it's not smooth. It doesn't flow consistently. It has a weight, it has a feel. I think there's also some element of surprise of how little reference to actual water there is in the exhibition. And through that disparity, I think that's what the artist took away. Water is so precious. Um, it's such a resource and its value is so important that the way they show that is through largely the absence of water. You know, when you combine the arts and sciences, the art is able to tap into those emotions. And I think it's those emotional uh, triggers, if you will, that really ask the viewer to look more deeply and to think about what their what their own response is and hopefully motivate them to to seek out more so I think I'll start with my piece um, groundwater which um, is a fountain like a fiberglass fountain the fountain instead of flowing with water the idea is that this is flowing with sand instead because I'm hoping that people connect with like all of their emotional connotations that they have with water how they find it relaxing and comforting 
And then I love the way that sand contrasts that. Like it's a little, you know, you can taste it in your mouth when it moves around and it doesn't sound the same. The title Groundwater is a bit of a, a pun, right? <laughs> but there's also a little bit more of a direct reference to some of the stuff that we learned in the boot camp. A lot of uh, like laws and traditions around water in Arizona are really strange, really backwards. And one of them is like this weird bifurcation we have in our laws between um, the way that groundwater is managed and the way that surface water is managed. Like that's one of the things that I kept coming back to as so counter to even even, you know, like not even modern understandings, but like like we've known that for a while that groundwater and surface water are linked, but we treat them as totally separate entities and that causes a lot of conflict. And so I wanted to speak to that conflict a little bit. Floodlines is a piece which is a um, installation in the gallery here at the Coconino Center for the Arts. And I, I early on I started envisioning like what, what would it look like or feel like if we filled up the space so that it you know filled up with water and so this piece, Floodlines, marks a series of lines on the wall inside the gallery at different heights. And the idea is that those mark different levels of water um, that would fill up the volume of the space. Uh, and the difference between those lines is that they reference different dollar amount, the purchase amount of water. So every line is $100 of water. But the reason they're different is because you can buy them at different rates. So $100 worth of water for, from the Central Arizona project to be used for agriculture, um, you can fill this gallery space up to uh, within a foot of the ceiling. But if, say for instance, you're hauling water onto your, you know, your rural property on the Navajo or Hopi reservation, you can maybe stand in an inch of water. Like, you know, it might get the bottom of your feet wet. I mean, embedded in the difference between these lines is a pretty deep inequity. One of the implications of the piece is seeing that inequity and feeling that inequity. And that, that, that price affects the way that you use it, like how careful you are with it. And I don't blame anybody for that relationship. Like that's one, that's one that we all have. I'm arguing that, that our world is really profoundly impacted by the way that humans, like the way that we're impacting it through the things that we consume and then, and then ultimately throw away or discard. And that word consumption parched <laughs> uh, is is particularly apt for the way that we deal with water like that's that's really the way that we think about water water should be more expensive <laughs> it needs to be uh, co costlier especially for those industries that use it most heavily agriculture is the number one user of water in the state of Arizona because it's so cheap and our, and our laws are so are so loose so um, there's no incentive to be conservative with it and that's causing some really severe problems so water needs to be more expensive than it is when Neil contacted me he he already had a, a clue that not everyone paid the same price for water. And, and so the Central Arizona Project, which brings massive quantities of water to Phoenix and Tucson, has a differential pricing scale. Ag is the lowest agriculture uses, and I think it's still about $80 an acre foot. Uh, municipal and industrial, they're up over $100 an acre foot. I don't know what the current is, maybe 120 in that range. For our residential water that I'm paying in Flagstaff, we pay $1,000 an acre foot. Well, if you live in the Navajo Reservation, you have to haul water. The price of your water includes your pickup truck, your travel distance, your time, you know, to fill maybe a several hundred gallon container, and you use it very carefully. Water pricing is based more on how different groups of people have been able to negotiate contracts rather than because water has a universal price. Yate she kli benali dasha jine todich itni shabash chin aro nakai dine dashanela shima e beitha chi i aro beitha chi dash che tisa jine na sha aro kinsana shahuan my name is Klee Benali. I'm originally from Black Mesa on the Diné or Navajo Nation, and currently I reside here in Flagstaff, Arizona. So I created two lenticular pieces for Parched, um, and lenticular imagery is really basic, like 3D um, optical illusion. The Ma'i is part of our creation history where the Ma'i or the coyote stole the babies from the water and that precipitated a mass flooding. And so that world, basically we had to 
leave because of that treachery. And we have an attorney working at the Navajo Nation and for many years, water warriors, water protectors have been fighting to address what they see as his um, duplicity in selling Diné people or Navajo people short from our inherent rights to water sources. And our peoples, you know, don't want to just settle for small drops. We want to make sure that, you know, we have right and access to what we are entitled to based upon one, this is our ancestral homelands and nobody owns water. And two, if you're gonna manage water on that level, negotiating it for unsustainable metropolitan areas shouldn't be part of that. And so many of my elders, many of the organizers um, called Stanley Pollock the new Ma'i, you know, the person who is this duplicitous lawyer who's, you know, selling our people short for our water rights. And it says to e ina, which means water is life on the other side. And it's sort of splattered in blood to be a little, um, I guess, sensational, because uh, water is life, but it also means death. If we're really looking at the fact that if we don't have water, we die, especially in the south, the arid Southwest, where we are literally dealing with droughts. Over 30% of the Navajo Nation, as well as the Hopi tribe, don't have access to running water. 22 wells from the EPA have been closed because of high levels of radioactivity. And on top of that, we're facing climate issues and extractive industries that are depleting our water tables or polluting our water, our water sources. So our springs are drying up. And so all of the pieces that I created here have some representation of the conflict that we have not just regarding water, but regarding existence and the challenges that we have for our survival as human people. So my first work and still current work is looking at water issues out on Navajo. Um, many people, like they estimate 30% of the homes don't have running water. And so um, people rely on all kinds of different sources. The difference between regulated and unregulated wells is that regulated wells or water is tested um, periodically by a government entity. That typically is the water that is pumped into folks' houses you think of it as tap water. Unregulated wells, on the other hand, are not tested regularly and they are not meant for human consumption. Um, out on Navajo, those wells are used, are supposed to be used for the livestock and so forth. But because of the infrastructure issues, people, if it's convenient, will use those unregulated wells. They'll say, you know, grandma has been drinking from this well forever, it's fine, the water tastes good, that type of thing. Arsenic and uranium can be high in some of these wells because partly the underlying geology. So um, the Colorado Plateau was a place that there were higher levels of uranium in the ore, so that's why it was mined. And as a result then that also can affect the wells or the aquifers that are underlying that geology. And so depending on the depth of the well, depending on which aquifer it's drawing from and so forth, um, there can be higher levels of uranium and arsenic. It's a cameraless process and I use color photographic paper, which I mount on steel plates and I go into the water um, or submerge the paper under water and then expose it to a flash. And then anything that's in the water above the paper is captured as a, a shadow image. And once that's captured, I take them out of the water, rinse them off, hang them to dry, and then process them and that becomes a paper negative. The boot camp was wonderful because it gave me the opportunity to see how water is used and abused in different ways throughout the state. Towards the end of the boot camp, when I heard Ernest talk about the arsenic-tainted water on the Hopi Reservation and the work was, that he has been doing to uh, get filters into the homes of everybody on the reservation, I was pretty fascinated. I really wanted to see what that water looked like. The name is Ernest Tahoe and I work with uh, the Black Mesa Trust out of Hopi in Kukutsmobi. 
In our Black Mesa Trust project, we've purchased water filters for the community members. And what these present are the images of what the water holds. And this image right here, particularly, is a picture of a resident's home with a filter attached. So this is a picture of a filtered water here. Um, if we move down just a little bit to this picture, this is also from a resident home, uh, Second Mesa. This image is a non-filtered image of the water. One of the big challenges was accessing the water. Because the water is so sacred on the reservation, there's no way I could go into any body of water. Uh, Ernest and I brainstormed and came up with the idea of collecting water from filtered and unfiltered sources mm -hmm. and then bringing it back to Tucson where I used it in my darkroom. I just put it into a big tub in my darkroom and exposed the photograms that way. The reservations in the, is in the United States of America and they have water that's the quality of third world countries. Um, so I think that's astonishing. And I hope people will support the project of helping get clean water to Hopi homes. The um, filters that we have, we originally started out with a single uh, unit. Um, that was basically for the arsenic. But like I was saying, we did find out we had more than just the arsenic problem. We had vanadium, uranium, along with other small uh, TDS contaminants. So we switched from the single unit to a double unit. So one of the filters will handle the arsenic problem, and the second unit to that would be the uranium filter, and that'll take care of the uranium through that. Man, he's making things happen. I guess it takes one person to make something happen, and he's doing that right now. And you know, a lot of these homes, a lot of the families are, are buying Brita filters, and that's all great and everything, but really it's still not taking out the contaminants that we have in our water. We have been looking more at uranium as more of a chemical toxicant that could potentially do damage to our DNA, that could cause mutations and move into cancer. When we drink water that has higher levels of uranium, it gets filtered through our kidneys and so then can accumulate there. Arsenic is really a bad player in the sense that it makes underlying health conditions worse. So there's a number of different approaches to treating water in order to bring it into the regulatory levels. A difficulty with uranium in filter systems is that when those filters saturate, you have this filter now that has high levels of uranium and there are laws against transporting uranium on the reservation. And so now you have these filters that you, it's difficult to do anything with them. There's, you know, reverse osmosis uh, uh, types of, of systems. They tend to need a lot of power. So that's another issue out on Navajo is besides a water infrastructure problem, there's a power problem. So there's difficulties there. So people are trying to figure out a solution for some of these wells that could be treated, but with, you know, some of these underlying issues, it's not as simple as putting in a system, say, in an urban area. One of the sites that we visited was the Scottsdale Water University, and they have you know, a state-of-the-art water treatment plant. So they can take sewage and turn it into really very, very clean water. But what was striking about that is that they use that water, they sell that water to golf courses. And so, yes, it's, you know, from a water conservation perspective, it's a good use of reclaimed water. We'd rather use reclaimed water than pure water on a golf course. But we went there in the boot camp the day after we were on the reservation where we were talking to families that don't have running water. You know, it's not right. It's not fair that there's people in our country that don't have access to safe drinking water. It's not a problem that's unique to Arizona. I think everybody knows what went on in Flint, Michigan, and yet there's other municipalities that they can afford to have the best technology to clean water to use on golf courses and for recreation. I'm from a place with a lot of water. I'm from northern Michigan. Uh, I'm from a small town called Petoskey that's on Little Travers Bay on Lake Michigan. I come from a place that is really different than here. And I think, you know, when we grow up in a place, that's like where, how we set our baseline and how we 
perceive everything kind of after that, really. So I, I think that we, we don't think about the use of water as much. Looking at, you know, like a southwestern la landscape here, we can see where all that water is. We can see it by the color of the land. You know, we can see it by the way the landscape shapes itself. You know, ecosystems that are based around where the water is, where 100 yards away that ecosystem doesn't exist anymore. I wasn't familiar with that coming from northern Michigan. You know, that was a sh kind of a shocking, every kind of layer of that was shocking to me as I discovered it more and more. And uh, it was especially striking to me when I got a drone up in the air and I looked down and you can see, um, you can see through sort of the color spectrum where water is being used, where these ecosystems are happening. Sometimes it would require uh, me to like, you know, fly over no trespassing signs, fly over private property signs, fly into gated communities. Um, and so that's a, another aspect of sort of the drone that is um, really great in terms of like, it gives access to spaces that you know we normally might not have access to. I, I've got six pieces that um, kind of, I feel like showcase sort of this conflict. And it's a conflict of sort of where water use butts up against the desert, butts up against wild spaces, and where humans have kind of made these changes to the landscapes. And um, I think that like within the framework of this project, you know, it's hard to sort of understand how dry the desert is until you see water next to it. So I traveled to Yuma, you know, I found you know, some orchard, date, date tree orchards, I found alfalfa fields. I traveled to uh, west of Phoenix to some fields that are owned, uh, they're Saudi Arabian owned companies that grow hay for their horses. Um, they grow the hay here in Arizona because it's illegal to grow that hay in Saudi Arabia and our regulations are so lax that it's easy and cheap for them to grow it here. I flew over golf courses. I flew over sort of exclusive communities that you know kept the public out. I found myself a lot, in a lot of cases thinking about you know these water pipelines and the cap and the types of things that sort of crisscross our state so that we can decide who gets the water and who doesn't. We can see the water. We can see the water up against the desert. We can see the sort of stockpiling. You know, it's almost like we're stockpiling the color in the landscape, really, because, you know, when that water ends, the desert kind of drains itself of most of the color that, you know, we can see. first site that we went to was the Glen Canyon Dam in the Colorado River because you cannot think about water in the western United States and the southwestern United States without thinking about dams, hydropower, storage, and water allocation. And the Colorado River built the west. Cities from Phoenix to Tucson to Denver, Los Angeles, Las Vegas all rely on Colorado River water. Colorado River water also fuels our most productive agriculture. If you're eating a salad in the winter, you're also consuming water from the Colorado River. So we were immediately confronting artists with trade-offs and conflicts. If you're prioritizing diverting water to cities for drinking, for swimming pools, for golf courses, or to agriculture so we can have fruits and vegetables all year long, well, then you're taking water from free-flowing rivers. And so it's very, very striking that we're moving water. I mean, water naturally moves, but we're allocating water um, to certain users and not to other users, even when it's running right through their land. So there's something called the Central Arizona Project that was developed in, in, in conjunction with the desire to bring more water to Phoenix and Tucson, which those communities were dependent on groundwater. They've been overdrafting groundwater for years. When the Central Arizona project moves a million and a half acre feet, that's a lot of water, a year, they have to lift water hundreds of feet out of the Colorado River and then they flow by gravity to the next low spot and they're pumped up 14 times. So it takes a lot of energy uh, to move water. So again, the connection between indigenous people living in a place for many, many generations being displaced in order to provide cheap water to Phoenix and Tucson is a thread 
in this story that, that's very important. I live out in the Black Mesa region of northeastern Arizona on the Navajo Hopi Reservation. And I live in a place called Big Mountain. That's, you know, where my ancestors lived. And that's where I grew up for the most part. And that's where I returned to build a home. A Hogan is a place of ceremony and healing and going to out the east entrance is like a new day and new beginning. And so you have a line of people out there that represents the fence that was erected uh, on the land as a result of um, the so-called Navajo Hopi land conflict that happened to that community. Breaking that fence means that like we're trying to find sustainable ways but also that you have to move the people it ha they have to be healed for them in order to move and so when you see that that vase that i'm carrying is a water vase as, as you give it to the people they come to life it's like a seed they represent the seed and they go and they plant and they grow What I'm talking about is very much connected to water and air and land and all the things around us. But when the land is being degraded because of this whole land conflict I'm talking about was all about that they wanted Phoenix to grow into a big glamorous city. And that's what you see today. I mean, if you didn't know the history of Phoenix, you, you would think maybe that's normal, right? All that water that's down there, all the fountains, all the greenery, because Phoenix in, in reality doesn't have any water. They pumped the ground a long time ago. It, it's, I always say it's at the expense of, the, on our back, of what happened to our community. Growing up there, you used to see the community, it used to be an oasis where you could plant your crops and not worry about rain. It was alive and people were there. And today you look at it and it looks empty. It's just like people going through a war in a way. People get affected certain ways because of the conflict. So my community that remain on the land, even though people try to remain strong and resilient, it really affected them. And what if we did have water? That would be the question. This was done at our expense. That's how I see it. We grew Phoenix into what it is at our expense, and that's being parched. By the time I was born in Phoenix, Arizona's main perennial rivers had been dewatered. The Salt River, dry, used to be a perennial river, had beaver in it. Gila River, which the salt is a tributary, dry, dammed. We've taken water out of the river in the desert to grow crops initially and now to replace agricultural lands with suburban development. And that sequence has come with it and has been enabled by inexpensive water. One of the reasons why the Central Arizona Project was built is the early dams weren't sufficient to keep Arizona growing and they relied more and more on groundwater. The groundwater in the basin range, the kind of geologic area around Arizona, that water is fossil water. It was added to those basins at the end of the last ice age, 12, 15,000 years ago. You pump it out and it's not replaced. That groundwater supply has now been replaced by the Colorado River to some extent through the system that I described earlier. <laughs> In my family, my mother was uh, new herbs. My uh, father was a nightway Yeviche dancer. My mother's sister was a crystal gazer, hand trembler, um, and her brothers were medicine men. So all these people are gone. So all their knowledge is gone. So, and I, I remember some of what I've learned from them and try to work with it in my art. And so the clouds and the, the rain is part of it. The texts um, 
Those are uh, words for water by tribes in Arizona. We, we looked at the Colorado River coming out from the watershed all the way from Colorado all the way down from further north. So along the water, there's all these indigenous people. I guess just to emphasize that part of it, to, to say that these people have a word for water and it's sacred to them and they're still here, they're still planting, some of them, they're still, not all of us live in cities. I try to include um, both northern and southern tribes and some tribes in Mexico. Dene, Dene, Hopi, Tonat, um, Miyaki, have a Supai or Wallapai, um, Paiute, um, and Maricopa, and uh, Taramara, and um, the, maybe the Pai group, Pai Pai, there's a Pai Pai group in Mexico, Apache, I think I said. Another thing about the water is water is very sacred to the Diné people, water and clouds, wind, because uh, the, the clouds in the water actually created, gave birth to our ancestors who eventually created us. So in the boot camp, we talked a lot about reclaimed water. And reclaimed water is, you know, in ways a double-edged sword. So it's got some really great benefits, but then it's also got some concerns. Reclaimed water is water that's treated at a higher level so that it can go directly to another use. So that sounds great, and it is great, because of course we're looking to conserve water. And so if we can use reclaimed water, for example, in some agriculture or some landscaping, reclaimed water is a wonderful use of water because it doesn't need to meet the standards of, for example, drinking water. But there's issues of where and when we use reclaimed water. Snowball, the ski area that's north of Flagstaff, is using reclaimed water to make snow. But that has both health concerns and then more importantly, it really clashes with the spiritual values of many, many tribes that see the San Francisco Peeps as sacred sites. And so as scientists, we can measure all sorts of things, but from a perspective of a sacred site, that really has almost no meaning. So this piece is basically a 22 foot diameter circle made of steel, big trough, uh, similar to a big circular trough you'd see out in the desert forest. Uh, this is 12 inches deep and it's filled with thousands of cattail heads, which you tear apart and create cattail down. They're beautiful plants. They got these heads that are like big hot dogs, and you just twist them and they pop open and they explode. Whether it's cattail down or pine sap or pitch, it's all these natural materials that I used to play with as a boy up in Idaho. There was cattails and we would take those and just fill the whole Forest Service road with cattail down. So that material is now, I'm playing, basically playing with it again. <laughs> and in the center of the circle, the axis is a black hole. And then dangling from the light above will be a cottonwood leaf. And I was attracted to the, the shape of the cottonwood leaf. And so I started investigating what it meant to me what it meant to other cultures. Right up front is a place where there's water. That's where cottonwood leaves or trees grow. And in now that I'm here in the Southwest, that's wherever there were cottonwood leaves, I knew there was water. So the cattail down was a perfect symbol for snow. I learned about the San Francisco peaks and what they symbolize to the native peoples of this area. I wanted to speak about, and especially once Snowball Corporation started getting reclaimed water from the city, effluent water, wastewater, even though the water may be somewhat safe, the controversy for me is the symbolic nature of it. It's a sacrilegious thing to spray waste on Mother Earth. It's basically how I view it. And I 
don't have patience for those people, including myself, who go and uh, justify their need to uh, recreate. It's a solo, mythic, poetic performance. I go through many transformations throughout this piece, and the main character of it is a large, kind of reptile, lizard-like character that's the protector of the water, the, really the embodiment of the water. The first part is the apocalypse, and that has a very um, dry feeling to it where I'm really trying to get into the space of what is it like to die of thirst? What is it like if there were no water? And um, there's an image that I really worked off of to create that first section, which is um, a coyote that uh, was in this water hole that had dried out and just, it looked like the coyote just died looking for water. And it happened the very next day that there was a monsoon and the whole thing got covered with water. So what is it like to die of thirst? And then what is it like to drown? The next section, the resurrection section, is about this being underneath the water or underneath the earth that has been asleep for eons, that has been extinct for eons, and the earth has actually gone through so much um, destruction that it looks like just a planet of white ash. And so this being starts emerging from underneath the earth after all of the ice has melted. Then it goes into another section that's more, um, I, I really work with the image of how does water move? Um, there's nothing quite so beautiful and smooth and um, continuous and sinewy as water. And so I've worked a lot with how, how does movement, how does water move through your body, through your joints, through your muscles? And basically, how do you move your own water? We are water. That, the third section is, is about um, really embodying the qualities of the movement of water. Sean and I, I guess we met when this project first started. I think it was him that had the idea of me being inside of the cattail down, piles and piles of cattail down. But when we did it for the first time, it took two and a half hours for everyone, five people, to cover me in cattail down, one uh, cattail head at a time. So it could be many, many things. It could be ash, the phoenix rising from the ash. It's up to the viewer's imagination of what they see. And I think that since this is kind of a, a wordless process, there's going to be all kinds of interpretations of what people see. And the last section is a ceremony with the audience about um, really taking water as a sacrament and looking at it as we, we kind of take it for granted that it, you turn on the faucet and it's there. But what if there were no more water and you're holding the last water in your hands? How precious it is. I had a very powerful dream one time. A voice in my dream said, what will you miss when you're gone, when you're dead? And I immediately answered in the dream, water. There would be no life without water. Everything depends on water. And what is it to treat it with more respect and more, um, more care? You know, what we've always said, water has a spirit. And most people don't think that they believe in any spirit, right? But water does have a spirit. It has a body. It can hear you, you know. Everything we do in our culture out on Hopi is for water and to bring moisture. Every, all, our, all our ceremonies are tied to, to water. 
water is life and it, it, it's very powerful if you take care of it and if you respect it. The science is on our side in terms of like knowing what to do with the water and how to conserve it, but that doesn't really seem to matter. The science does not match our laws and habits and attitudes around water. What's happening with that disconnect? And I think that's one of the roles that art can play. I think you have to engage people through that information on an emotional level, on a gut level, before you can expect them to like make changes in their life or changes in their attitude. And so I think that's one of the, the strengths that, that art can bring to science. Perhaps the most prominent piece that I created for Parched is a piece that I call Storm Patterns Number no. 2. The concept here is to take a traditional Navajo rug, or at least the design of one with storm patterns, and modify that and bring it with projection mapping alive. If a rug was woven at the beginning of our time, our creation as Diné people, with a hajinet or the creation history with Ma'i or uh, the coyote, as I mentioned before, who in our traditional history and our emergence stole water babies. And so what if that rug witnessed that through time and we could witness that narrative through the sort of like weaving. Um, and so I wanted to create that visual element that in some ways echoes, but it isn't a ceremony um, and addresses harmony and disharmony. I just wanted to play with those elements to have them be represented, you know, more lively um, as opposed to with the traditional rug patterns. There's actually sort of two components that complement each other. There's a projection mapped on the floor as well with a pot that holds part of that story because the pot is a vessel that carries water, but it's filled with sand in this. Uh, exhibit and the bottom section has some of the connections to sand paintings um, that really are part of the narrative of the creation history for our people. Wherever there's a environmental crisis, there is a social or cultural crisis, especially for indigenous people, because we're people of the land. So whatever you do to the earth, and it's not just a cliche, you do to us. People don't see that on the same terms here though, and I think it's critical. It's like the fact that somebody can desert, spray 180 million gallons of treated sewage on a mountain that's holy to 13 indigenous nations is an extreme act of um, white supremacy in a, just a questionable use of water, even if it's wastewater, which could be discharged back into aquifer and filtered out naturally, considering the cultural affront with the desecration and the concept of spraying treated sewage on a sacred place. And then, you know, the just use of water, just is a bad message. And so the demonstrations are from that. Uh, there was mass police repression, people were arrested violently and aggressively. And I, I think like not a lot of people see that, but I think for the mountain and for the region, indigenous folks, just, it's never a lot left our mind. And so that's part of the weaving. Um, some of the other demonstrations were from resistance to S2109, the Little Colorado River S Settlement Act. And so there's a big banner in there that says water is life in multiple languages in Hopi, Diné, in Spanish and English as well. This is how bad it has to get is people actually subjecting themselves to arrest and, you know, in the fight um, for clean water, uh, to, for access to just, you know, water to sustain their ways of life. This isn't right. Something about this is wrong and I don't agree with this. And I'm not gonna go along with your status quo because what that means is an end for us. It's like we don't have a future without water, so we need clean and healthy water to survive. Um, so that means, no, we're not going to go along. And, you know, I don't mind being confrontational and agitational and provocative on that level.
I think there's a lot of emotion around the water. There's a lot of anger around water. There's a lot of conflict around water that the artists pick up on. A lot of the artists really responded to our visit to Fossil Creek, which I think was a little, it was an opportunity for them to be in the space of water, to be in this place that nature had carved. It's this oasis in the desert. And as such, it was also like a resting point or a break in all of the conflict in, in a lot of the other sites on the field trips. And artists responded to that in so many projects. And I think that's another thing that, the, that their art provides is a resting point, it's like a pause. What the art asks you to do is slow down to gather those emotions and have the space to think deeply and form your own opinions. What we see now is a beautiful river, but for a hundred years, much of Fossil Creek was diverted for hydropower production. Over 10 years ago, a group of environmentalists lobbied the Arizona Public Service to decommission the hydropower dam and operation. Arizona Public Service and the government agencies did it for the people of Arizona. They did it to provide Arizona with a second wild and scenic river. And the project was a huge success. Everything came back. It's now an oasis of native fish, native insects, birds, and people now have one more place that they can really enjoy a wild and scenic river. But central to the recovery of Fossil Creek was what you don't see. So one of the big success stories of Fossil Creek is that we brought back the algae. And I know a lot of times people think of algae as slimy, but they're also the base of freshwater food webs. If you don't have healthy algae, you can't have healthy ecosystems. I think I was m most intrigued by the idea of Fossil Creek. I, you know, the whole project was about water. Um, so I was most intrigued with this one to try to work on um, the notion of the restoration of an ecosystem. These are microscopic images of algae. I got some references when I was in the lab um, and we were just going through the different algae that we had collected and just moving the microscope around until I saw things or compositions that I really liked and then we were just shooting them. There's three iterations of this project. So originally all I was thinking about was the idea of playing on size. So I liked the idea of working with something that was microscopic and doing them in a large format. And then when I started looking at the images through the microscope, I thought, you know, I really want to see if I can simulate that looking into the microscope. So the bottom tier of paintings are supposed to look like a slide under a microscope. And I kept the top three images because in the lab, you know, there's a certain point in time where it starts to disintegrate. So that's what I wanted to do was to show that disintegration of the algae and then the regrowth. When I'm looking at the algae, there is so much information in there. I mean, it's just so overwhelming. And so I wanted to find an, a nice bridge of does it kind of represent what I'm looking at, but still have an abstraction, um, an aesthetic quality to it? So trying to balance both. And I was really excited about doing this body of work because a lot of my, my pieces are very, very representational. And I think that the algae and the microorganisms lend themselves to something that's a little bit more abstracted. So even if I'm working representationally, it, it's already in an abstraction. So then I can look at how things are composed, how things are interacting, and then add that color element to it. So I hope that both artist and scientist would come in and take a look at it and, and get, you know, the same type of reaction. You know, I have a few different videos of different types of microorganisms, but for some reason this one was the most fascinating to me. It reminded me of like fly fishing because the organisms, you know, would shoot themselves out to get their feelers out and eat and then pull back in. So it was just constantly this back and forth of, of movement. So, you know, I just thought that having something in a still image, having something to match it in a movement was a, a nice bridge between the two.
the whole watershed of the Southwest uh, is depleting. You know, we're losing so much, we're not thinking about how we're using the water. So um, I was intrigued about the idea of the regeneration, the regrowth of what water can do. So just the, that whole idea of being in a place that had taken down the dams and had restored a complete ecosystem was very fascinating to me. And that, so that's one of the things that I was thinking about with this project was, you know, I hope to extend it, but I wanted to start right at the algae level and the microorganism level because all of that feeds into all the way back up to human life. When you're looking at something under a microscope and you can see things that are moving, that, that life is everywhere. I really firmly believe in when the indigenous people talk about water as life. Then to have these things that are living within an aquatic setting, just all of it feeds into each other. Things can reverse. Things can get better. You think that it's only going to get worse when you project into the future, but seeing Fossil Creek is like, okay, a few people can make a difference and a creek can start to flow again and we can change things. I'm grateful and honored to be part of Parched. I think that there's an opportunity to further the dialogue around water issues, but we should not come in understanding that it's gonna be a polite conversation or a comfortable conversation. And those conversations need to center the voices of indigenous people who have a long history since time immemorial with water and with the environment and understand how to live with nature, not just against nature. And that might mean drastically having to change what we do and not living with those same conveniences and not sustaining unsustainable ways of life. And it shouldn't mean doing that. So it's a challenge, it is a conflict, and I think we're gonna to continue to be parched until we actually have that real, real talk. Looking to the future, I'm concerned but hopeful. The science is clear. Climate change is already causing droughts in the southwestern United States. We've allocated water into the future that we're not gonna have. We want to be able to protect water uses for human needs. We want environmental justice, and we want water for nature. Something's got to give, and we're not sure what. But Parched and projects like Parched make me hopeful. I'm hopeful that people will come and see the exhibit and be inspired by the art that's been created. It will inspire them to learn more about water and to move towards more dialogue and some solutions. When I look across the space of the completed installation of this exhibition, what I feel is pride. The artists put so much work and thought into each of their projects across so many different themes. And with all the references to, to conflict and disparity, I think there's also a strong sense of hope. And I, I think that's reflected in the level of how much how much they put into their projects. So I think we're hoping to um, have more of a discussion to start with some, some questions about what came out of the film that you have questions for us and maybe be able to expand on some points. Delisa Miles is joining us. Hopefully you all know Delisa as a local um, amazing performance artist. Um, <laughs> we didn't get that introduction earlier. So um, 
Yeah. Is that start? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's not that I didn't know it, I just know it a lot more more detail now about how it's just so ironic to, to have the water go to where I lived in most of my life, Phoenix, um, and taken away from them, along with so many other things. I mean, are, the, the, are there possibilities now? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually hoping that you want to to, to this conversation, but I, you know, one of the elements of the essentially for a, a good year before convening the artists for the boot camp, there was a year of meetings and establishing of a steering committee of um, local, well, regional water experts um, who you know brainstormed a lot of ideas about what types of things wanted to be delivered to the artists in order for them to have inspiration to make work about. And um, one of the important elements to um, approach was this, you know, disparity of indigenous, um, indigenous and then also just water rights uh, in general. Um, and it was a really complex, it was a very complex, there were many layers of the conversation. I don't have an answer to your question except for the idea of just like um, illuminating these disparities through the, the field work um, gave artists a uh, firsthand um, perspective in order to respond to those and therefore hopefully reach an audience and create renewed awareness. But Jane, perhaps you could talk more about. Yes, th thank you for the question. You know, I think that there's a lot of development options on the reservation and it's a matter of policy and commitment. And I think um, the you know, there's a lot of proposals on the table to bring alternative energies um, up onto reservation lands. Because they're, you know, they're good lands for solar, they're reasonably good lands for wind. Um, there's also just room for investment for basic water infrastructure and finding out where um, people are getting their drinking water. And so, um, you know, people are so widespread out on the reservation. And COVID made it worse for the direct reasons of COVID and then also because um, there were curfews during a lot of the time and it was just more difficult for people to go in, that were hauling water to get water. So they started drinking water from wells that they probably shouldn't have. But just some of the, you know, the simple stuff of um, going and measuring and finding out you know what which wells are safe and which wells aren't Janie Ingram who's a faculty member up at NEU um, and Tommy Rock who might become a faculty member at NEU who grew up on the Navajo Nation um, are trying to build a program just to um, really basic data you know that 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 for most of the United States we have this data we you know we run around and we collect and we um, sample and we know if there's uranium and we know if there's arsenic and we know if there's E. coli and um, we need to make those investments up there uh, and, and and to educate people um, about u particularly the cancer causing uranium's uh, one of the ones and then arsenic's just uh, you know difficult because it makes everything worse as Janie said and so I think you know it, it's a commitment of resources a commitment of time and a commitment of um, changing the way we think about um, the power that n Native people have. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, our, our panel is limited on the perspective. Wh what was important on being in deliberately inclusive Indigenous perspectives was the understanding to um, visit and work one-on-one -on -one with Indigenous people, and if the artists um, we're here, I'm sure we'd hear different perspectives from that group as well, so I, I encourage you to keep asking those important questions. What other thoughts or questions are out there? Yes. At the Courier today, and they had an article where many, many uh, treaties were, um, I wish I could remember the exact number, were um, 
litigated and agreed to uh, by the by the indigenous people up up uh, in, in northern Arizona and southern Utah. Um, and, and what allowed that to happen was there was a lot of federal funding that was diverted to allow for the transportation and treatment and and that that contributed towards the settlement. So uh, I need to go back and reread that article in, in light of what you presented here. Uh, but it, it gave a little bit of hope that at least currently there's been some movement of years and years of these water right issues has at least now been settled uh, in favor of the, uh, well, for settlement you have to have agreement on both ends, but uh, it's better than what they had before, uh, which was an, an unsettled set of treaties. So, uh, I do have a question, now just a comment, now I have a question, it's much longer, much longer question. No. Uh, what was the inspiration? Who ins what was the inspiration for um, for even starting this project? And it might have been embedded in there, but I didn't really pick up on what was what was the seed that uh, created this uh, movement. Here. That's a question I can't answer. Um, so the Flagstaff Arts Council. Typically, every two years, arts and science collaboration on different themes. So there was. Fires of Change, um, uh, Hope and Trauma in a Poison Land that Edie Dillon was a participating artist in. Um, I'm forgetting another one, Parched, the Otter, Art of Water in the Southwest. So each of those models convenes um, science and experts in the field um, with a team of artists. So for Parched, I was invited to be the curator after I think the um, steering committee had started meeting to develop some ideas, but the, um, essentially the the prior arts and science collaborations had run surveys on um, for audience members to um, voice their ideas for the next most important topic to cover, which was water. Um, but also, interestingly, thinking about the past, the fires of change, the Union Project, they're all about water. You know, water's at the source of, of each of them, and so this is just an opportunity to focus on um, water as its own topic. <laughs> I know where I go from here is <laughs> on April 9th I'll do a live performance um, which will kind of be the culmination of the project as far as I know. It's had three different um, locations in Flagstaff and down at um, Ameren Museum south of Tucson and here. So it's only been the three locations, but I think that the documentary helps it travel beyond those places. Yep. So Julie and I are always conspiring. <laughs> and so I just think this, this combination of art and science is really powerful. And I think that, you know, I love science, science without apology. You know, we have people marching in the street for science. Um, and it's enhanced by artists who communicate in really different ways than scientists. And so, I, and one of the reasons I like the documentary so much is because it, you know, in this hour, you heard the voices of the scientists, you heard the voices of um, some environmental activists, and then um, the artists. And I just feel that um, I understand the topic better from having worked with the artists. It makes me, you know, see what rose to the the top of all the gazillions of details that I presented, of mo most of which they found boring. Um, but to find out, <laughs> you know, what really, you know, what really motivates people, what really interests people. And so, one of the things Julie and I are talking about is doing one of the um, youth art projects that are and having that have a, a science theme, either a climate change theme or a biome theme. Um, it's a it, it's an exhibit that the Coconino Center for, Center for the Arts does every year, um, and Julie's running it this year. And um, we're thinking of maybe next year having it be a, an art science collaboration um, with the theme yet to be determined. Um, I also just want to say a couple words about Fossil Creek because the watershed burned. Um, so it was the um, I'm going to forget the name of it right now, um, but a big fire in June. And um, so I thought I was done 
<laughs> you know, I spent like 10 years studying before the, the river was restored and then, you know, another five, uh, between being before and after. And, you know, I've published my papers and um, it's, you know, known nationally as a success story in river restoration because the hydropower dam was removed and then so were the non-native fish and everything um, pretty much recovered. And so um, before the fire, the biggest problem was for the Forest Service figuring out how to manage all the recreation there. And so now the watershed's burned and, um, you know, I'm hopeful because I tend to be hopeful um, that it will recover, but again, it's, you know, stream ecologists, is, which is what I am, we're just figuring out how streams are going to recover, if and how streams are recover, and all the species that live in streams with this enhanced um, frequency intensity of wildfires that we are, you know, we're absolutely um, seeing it in real time, and you know, the people that model climate science and, and fires that it really is, it is, you know, it's not just um, a spurious correlation, it is because of our changing climate. So Fossil Creeks, the chapters um, <laughs> reopened. Um, it's not as bad as we had thought, um, and there's areas of the creek that have not been burned, um, and there's areas of the creek that have, and I have, you know, a group of students b back in my lab now, um, and we're, you know, resampling and restudying it. Yes. The distribution or the. Yeah, so, yes. so the question yes. actually to follow up to the question, question about um, where does this l go next? Um, um, speak of the documentary, but also that as, as, as the exhibition has been traveling and the documentary being viewed, the artists have continued to make new works and several are still making um, new work on the theme of water. So it's just interesting to see how. Um, how you know paths change in the process. So the um, the documentary is uh, because of the support from the National Science Foundation. It's free. It's open. You know, it's it's available. It's, it, we want to get it out there as much as possible. Do um, programming along with it whenever possible. Um, but yeah, but that's sort of the piece that stays um, stays out in the public arena for sure. Oh yes, it's on it's on YouTube. We should get the the link up. The link. It's um, you could just you look up parched and it art with it and it'll pop right up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get a couple of us um, to if you do a virtual showing or even a live showing um, and get a you know we've had we've had some big virtual showings of it um, and then a lot of, a lot of the people can participate but it's free and we you know. We're excited for any ideas to continue to, to disseminate it. Yes? I'm curious. I'm, on the one hand, an engineer and a scientist. And on the other side, a musician. in what kind of a common language did the two sides start talking in? Because I read a lot about scientists talk show over our head, and the artists of all creative artists are talking from the heart or from the soul or spirit, which is basically the indigenous people. Was there a common language that you kind of sorted it out with? Yeah, and uh, this is one of my most favorite conversations I tend to have with Jane, so I'm hoping I'm capturing what Jane would say to this, which is art and science are not all that different. They both start with a deep sense of curiosity, and they just have different outcomes. I'm trying to think about that. We didn't have enough time really together. The artists and the scientists, there was so much information being put out that I think to develop a new language <laughs> takes time. And I would really love to see, I, th I think that there were new relationships being formed because of that project. Um, collaborating with Sean with the cattail down. You know, Sean um, 
we'd become good friends. And with each person that you meet, I think that there's always a new language that you have to discover because everyone's coming from slightly different places. And the better that you get at expressing yourself, maybe the better that other people get at getting you. <laughs> and and it, I think it just takes time. And, um, and I think that we made steps in that direction. I wish we could have had more interface, but you know, but wow, we, we just packed a lot in, so. <laughs> you know, one of the things, you know, as a scientist and as an educator, you know, and being a scientist is the greatest thing, so I'm not bashing that at all. Um, but that, you know, I think we communicate with so much jargon and we make things so much more difficult to understand, unnecessarily difficult to understand. And so, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm working on and some of my peers are in our teaching, you know, particularly in teaching graduate students who are making a commitment in some way to a career as a scientist, is to learn to communicate um, through storytelling and to bring their personal experience to their, to their science. And so I teach a graduate class for all of our first year graduate students. And I went rogue last year um, and said, okay, I'm not, you're not gonna just do a 15 page paper at the end, let's cut that in half and let's do a creative assignment. And you know, it can be anything. You can do a podcast, you can do a cartoon, you can write a story. And they loved it and they did such a good job at it and they, it makes them understand their science better. So these are young scientists that kind of understand what they're doing and kind of don't because they're, you know, they're figuring it out as they go. But having to express something creatively for a broader audience actually taught them more about their science than the traditional end of the paper, end of the class paper. So I think we have to just, you know, keep working together in um, whether it's, you know, um, writers, um, dancers, visual artists, that uh, the, the whole is bigger than the sum of the parts. I was going to say, I think it's interesting you asked the question of how to get scientists and artists to talk to each other in this building. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Tom established this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think, and, and Delisa, Delisa, I think, I think was, was the, the one who fostered, fostered the, the initial conversation about bringing Parched here, and it just was, of course, a very suitable suitable space. Of course, the small scale of the gallery, we didn't know how it was going to house the artwork, but I think it um, illuminates differ the different work than in the bigger space, and it, um, I think it came together well. Yes. Again, is it being shown on a regular basis? This, this is, is the, the last venue of the traveling, traveling exhibition. exhibition. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, so it's an especially meaningful closure for us. So, yeah. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, let's just give them a thanks. And for those of you who are interested in, in sharing this with friends and family, there is a catalog that you can purchase right out there in the lobby. So I encourage you to do that if, if you're interested in it. And I'm also encouraging you to get involved with the other programs that we have with Parched. You know, there's the artist workshop as well as the, the special performance by Delisa. So with that, I want to thank you all for coming out and look forward to seeing you again. <laughs>